Our gospel reading for this second Sunday of Advent comes to us from the gospel according to Matthew, the third chapter, verses 1 through 12. If you'd like to follow along, I'd invite you to do so at this time. It can be found in your pew Bibles on page 784. Let's all listen for God's word to us today. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite you, as we begin this sermon today, to think for just a moment about everything that you need to do and accomplish before Christmas. Can you do that? The errands that you have to run, the gifts that you need to purchase, the people that you're planning to see, and whether you're hosting them or traveling to them, everything you need to do to get ready for that visit. I suspect that most everyone in this room has some mental list like that going on during this month. A list of all the things you need to do to get ready for Christmas. Now, on that list, I'm wondering if any of you put down, go to the river. Anybody put go to the river on your list? No? No, I didn't think you would. Just to clarify, I don't mean the Reedy River. I mean the Jordan River. You see, the Jordan River is where you will find John the Baptist. And I'm wondering if anyone here is planning to go pay a visit to John the Baptist before Christmas. While you're thinking about that, let me be the first to say that going to see John the Baptist is not on my list of things to do before Christmas. Why? I think you know why. John just doesn't really feel like he's in the Christmas spirit right now. According to Matthew, this is what John will say. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Just all warm and fuzzy making inside, isn't that? You see, I don't want to go to the Jordan River this Advent because John is preaching judgment. And I don't know about you, but I don't really like judgment, especially mixing the word judgment with the word church. (laughs) Do you recall earlier this fall when we were talking about our vision and the pillars of Westminster? Humor me here and nod your head, yes, yes, good. Can you imagine if instead of a vision of open minds, open hearts, we said our vision at Westminster is that when you walk through these doors, you will be judged? No. Judgment is not something I like to preach. It's not something I like to receive. Heck, I've been known at different times in my life 
to do what I can to avoid someone else's judgment. I remember the <clears throat> semester in seminary when I was doing an internship as a hospital chaplain. It's the only time in my life where I've gone to work every day wearing a clerical collar. The collar was helpful in a hospital setting, even though I sometimes got confused at the hospital for a Catholic priest, it identified me very quickly as part of the clergy, as a member of the pastoral staff. But I never wore it outside of the hospital. I would put it on just as I was entering the hospital for work, and as soon as I left the hospital doors, I would take it off. So, one night, driving home after a long day, I was not paying close attention and I accidentally cut somebody off in the road. It was my mistake. I didn't even realize I had made the mistake until I saw the police lights in my rear view window. They belonged to the car that I had just <laughs> cut off. As I pulled over, I did some quick calculations and I whipped on my clerical collar. <laughs> The officer came over, asked me if I knew what I did. I said, no, I'm so sorry, I have no idea. He told me I had cut him off, no signal, no nothing, almost hit his car. And then with that clerical collar on, I kind of, you know, did like this to him. And I told him what a long day it had been at the hospital visiting this family and visiting that family. And he looked at me and he looked at my collar and he said, Father, this time I'll let you off with a warning. <laughs> I escaped that officer's judgment. I wasn't in the mood for judgment back then, and I'm not in the mood for John's judgment right now. So, if the question is whether you and I want to go to the Jordan River this Advent and hear the judgment of John, what's wrong with saying no? <laughs> Enjoy your month, John, but we'll be spending Christmas without you here at Westminster. That's where I was tempted to go today. There's just one thing, just one thing that kept me from going there, or I should say one person who kept me from going there, and that's Jesus. You see, Jesus was very influenced by John. Did you know that the first sermon Jesus ever preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near, that sermon is an exact duplicate of the sermon that John preached today. According to Luke, Jesus and John were cousins, and according to every gospel, Jesus was baptized by John. So what was it about John? and his message of judgment and repentance that Jesus thought was so important for us to hear. Let me get at it like this. I <clears throat> recall the time back when I was in college and with the basketball team. Remember, this was a very small school, Division III school, smaller than my high school, no athletic scholarships there, and I was the last person selected for that team, the bench warmer on the team. In fact, they would only let me in a game when we were up by 20 points or down by 20 points <laughs> with under one minute to go. It was the only time I saw playing time when I had zero chance of affecting the outcome of the game. All of which was perfectly fine by me. I was happy to just be along for the ride. We had a good coach, and like any coach, there were times <clears throat> when he disciplined the team. When he judged the performance that was taking place on the court, he would always <clears throat> direct his criticism toward the better players on the team, the ones who would actually make a difference in the game. And I recall one practice, I, I was loafing it. I mean, who cares, I won't play. And I remember very vividly catching the coach's eye as I was loafing it, and he threw down his clipboard and he barked, Ben, what did I just tell you to do? Do it. Well, I was stunned, I was shocked. My first thought was that he said my name by mistake. The coach had gotten on to me? <laughs> yeah, the coach had gotten on to me. 
at that moment, I turned beet red. My adrenaline went sky high. I was pretty embarrassed to be called out in front of all my teammates who were quietly smiling to themselves. But I also felt relieved, relieved because the coach cared enough to provide constructive criticism to anyone on his team, even the one who would not play. He wanted everyone to pay attention. I wonder if the judgment of God works something like that, not to punish us, but to get us to pay attention to pay attention to what is really important in the gift of life that God has given us. Do you think, do you think, if you and I were to consider a trip to the Jordan River this month, do you think John might try to get us to pay attention as well? I mean, it's so easy to get distracted at this time of year to focus on the wrong things this time of year, to feel like we're being pulled in every direction, a million things to do. And before we know it, another Christmas has gone by, and it begins to feel like the time that God has given you has just kind of slipped right through your fingers. A few years ago, the columnist Frank Bruni wrote a piece about how his family vacations have changed in recent years. He said that every year his family and extended family designate one whole week to get together. He admits, however, that he used to fudge just a bit on the length of his stay at those gatherings. He would arrive a day late. He would leave a couple days early. He would tell himself, and others that it was quality time that he was after, that he was just too busy to spend the entire week there with his extended family. But then he goes on to describe how more recently he's changed his tune, how he's made a point to be there from the beginning to the end, and how he's found that the quantity of time that he spends is just as if not more important than the so-called quality of time. He says, with a more expansive stretch, there's a better chance that I'll be around at the precise moment when one of my nephews drops his guard and solicits my advice about something that's really important to him. Or when one of my nieces will need someone other than her parents to tell her that she's really smart and really beautiful. I know how my 80-year-old father feels about dying, religion, and God, he says. Not because I scheduled a discreet encounter with him at one point. I know because I happened to be in the passenger seat of his car when he was driving and such thoughts were on his mind, and when, for whatever reason, he felt like sharing them with me. Bruni concludes, we delude ourselves when we invoke and venerate so-called quality time, imagining that we can plan instances of extraordinary candor, plot episodes of exquisite tenderness, or engineer intimacy at an appointed hour. There is simply no substitute for physical presence. In other words, how are you spending your time this Advent? Are you rushing from one thing to another, or are you paying attention to the people whom God happens to bring across your path? Do you see where John's judgment takes us? John may have preached judgment, but that judgment was just one color in a much broader and bigger and more beautiful painting of God's love. John was preaching repentance and second chances, and he was telling everyone, you've still got time. Time to get rid of the grudge. Time to let go of your anger. Time to put away your pride. Time to repair the relationship. Time to be a different person. Time to pay attention 
to whomever or whatever God wants you to pay attention to because maybe, just maybe in an unplanned conversation or a surprising moment of vulnerability, you won't just find yourself in a conversation with that person. You might find yourself in the very presence of the living God. In his recent book, Elusive Grace, the pastor Scott Black Johnston tells the story of what happened one summer when he and his family were staying at the family cabin in northern Minnesota. It was time to get the septic tank taken care of, so he called the first name that he found. He had a quick chat with a guy named Steve. Steve promised to pump the tank the following Monday when Scott and his family would be out. Scott promised to leave a $200 check under the welcome mat. The following Tuesday, Scott returned to the cabin, only to find the check still waiting under the mat, so he gave Steve a call. Oh, I'm awfully sorry about that, Steve said. I I've been dealing with a few things. You see, I, I just got diagnosed with cancer. It's my third go-around, and I've been trying to set up appointments and all that. Oh, my gosh, Scott replied. I'm so sorry. Listen, you need to focus on getting better. I'll call someone else. No, no, Steve said. No, I, I can use the 200 bucks. How about I come by next Monday? That would be fine, Scott replied. I'll see you then. And, uh, oh, Steve, if it's okay, I'll put you in my prayers. Well, the following Monday was a miserable day. It was raining. It was chilly. The mosquitoes were out in attack squadrons. And then, at about 7 a.m., the worst-looking septic tank truck Scott had ever seen came rumbling down the driveway. It was belching smoke. It was losing paint. It was spackled with all the stuff that had already been vacuumed out of other tanks. Scott says that he walked outside, intending to hand Steve his check and beat a hasty retreat back into the cabin. As Steve stood up to greet him, though, Scott noticed a big green Jesus fish decal on the back of the truck's tank. Do you know what that is? Steve asked. Yes, Scott replied. It's the ancient symbol for Christ. I knew you would know, Steve replied. I knew it because you said you would pray for me. Well, Scott mumbled, I, I sort of had to do it. After all, I'm a pastor. At this, Steve's eyes lit up. Me too. I'm a pastor at the Independent Gospel Church in town. Scott smiled. He said it was an absurdly awful moment. The smoke, the rain, the mosquitoes, the smell, the Jesus sticker. Inside his head, a voice was pleading, hand the man the check and walk away. But he couldn't walk away because Steve was still talking. Scott, thanks for giving me an extra week. I've got to admit, I'm sort of worried about this whole cancer thing. The doctors, they say I'm tough. I've beaten it twice. But I have a daughter in college and bills to pay. And I'm wondering, could we pray right now? With that, he peeled off one of his heavy, black, disgusting-looking gloves and took Scott's hand in his, and they said a prayer together. When Scott finally came back inside the cabin, his wife asked, what took you so long? And Scott replied, Jesus, Jesus has been meddling with my life once again. Now, I don't own a septic tank, and I don't own a cabin in northern Minnesota, but I do own a heart that needs cleaning. And I do have a soul that needs repentance and renewal and grace. And I was going to suggest that we could find those gifts if we all head to the Jordan River this Advent and spend some time with John. But you know what? I changed my mind. I changed my mind because I've got a better place for all of us to go. If you're looking for a place where every child of God is welcome, where people will walk with you in your weakness, where repentance is prized and God's grace is found in abundance, you don't have to go to the Jordan River to find it. This Christmas, 
the people who can offer you those gifts, they're seated right here in this room with you. Amen.